I have a good buddy who's knocking it all the, out of the ballpark in Wall Street. And he went to Harvard. He's obviously a brilliant guy. He's a brilliant businessman. And he's doing very well on Wall Street. And he says to me with great honesty, when I was at Harvard, I was a moral relativist. But now as I look back on my life, I realize why I was a moral relativist. I wanted to have sex, sex, and more sex with different sex partners. The only problem was I experienced guilt. And the way I dealt with my guilt was to say, morality's relative. I'm not doing anything wrong. There's no such thing as wrong and right. And so in university, we're at a time in life where we have a very strong sex drive. And in order to justify living a sexually promiscuous life, moral relativism is incredibly attractive. I was speaking at the University of Arizona, and I made some real attacks on rape. And I said, it's embarrassing to look at the statistics on how many women in university get raped how evil? Guy raises his hand and says, I date rape. And I said, you've got to be kidding me. How on earth do you justify that? And he says, very simple. I have a high testosterone level. And I said, well, sir, like it or not, that's really evil. That is totally dehumanizing a woman. I couldn't believe he was so honest, but I found it refreshing. All you got to do is look at the statistics, guys. An incredible number of young women are raped. And it's sick, it's evil, and it, the reason it's evil is not because I'm a nice white guy. It's evil because God created women and men in his image. He created our sexuality for a purpose, and that purpose is not to rape, not to date rape, but to learn to control yourself and to make a lifelong commitment to one person and enjoy sex within the context of a heterosexual marriage. Thanks for raising that. Yes, sir. I'm sorry. That's a completely unbelievable story for the pure fact of like somebody raising their hand and saying, I raped someone and didn't either immediately get jumped or reported to the police or anything of that nature. That's just a completely implausible story to me because I know for certain, like, if in a crowd of 20 to 30 people, you say, I rape people on the regular, that's not going to go well for you. can't help but think you made up that story. Oh, all right. Thanks for your honesty. I appreciate yeah. that. I promise you, sir, the guy raised his hand. He didn't say I raped people. He said, I have date raped and I support date rape. That's what he What's said. That difference? That's At rape. the University of Arizona, Tucson, Arizona, several years ago. That happened. And I can promise you, sir, I would think if you were out here on Monday, the way a couple of students treated me, that you would understand that that is not so implausible. When I have a guy standing right here waving his backside in my face, that's pretty outrageous. Like we're asking, were there any like, repercussions? Like, like for him saying that? that he rapes people on the regular? He didn't say I rape people on the regular. He date said I've rape. done date rape. That is, that is rape. Okay, define that's date rape, rape, then, rape because it sounds like you think that they're different things. Yeah. That, that is just Yes, rape. they are different in a person's mind. A person will use the phrase date rape to justify their evil. The same way a person will use eugenics to justify wiping out Jews. No. 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 Oh, yes. No. Oh, yes. Exactly what the Nazis date did. Is drugging someone to rape them. That he he rape. literally admitted to rape and, yes. and nothing happened. Nothing happened. I can't. That's not possible. I mean, but if they're. Well, then you're living in fantasy, ma'am. No, and I sir. Didn't you're living no. He said it flat out. And I can promise you, to, for you to say what you say right now and to think that you don't judge would be a joke. I judge someone who rapes people, yes. I yeah, no, no, no. Judge. You made a judgment call about me lying. That is amazing that you would be that judgmental. Incredible. You weren't there. I was at the University of Arizona in Tucson, Arizona, and the guy said it flat out. And for you to say, I'm lying, wow, where do you get off accusing me of lying when you don't have the faintest idea what the guy said? 
And by the way, I also used to live in South Boston, and I also used to confront white racists. And I can promise you those white racists in South Boston said a lot of really trashy things. And I also was almost beaten up and hit with, and almost got bricks hitting me in the head in South Boston because I stood against racism. And I can promise you, a hundred years ago, if that student on Monday would have done to somebody what he did to me, he'd have been in trouble. He's not in trouble today, but he would have been in trouble. Culture does change, doesn't it? What's acceptable and what's unacceptable in a culture changes. So you're saying that him saying that he date rapes, are you saying that that's acceptable? Is that what you're saying? How on earth, in light of the fact that I just said that was absolutely evil, I confronted the guy and I said, sir, what you did was evil in spite of the fact that you have a high testosterone level. But you did nothing about it. You didn't report him to the police? You say it's he evil, just, but you do nothing about it. He just it. admitted verbally to raping someone. That is grounds to go to the police and say, hey, this student, take a picture of him, because you can do that, free nation. Take a picture of him and be like, this student on the Arizona, University, University of Arizona, Arizona campus, Arizona, right? told me he raped someone. Yeah. And that he partakes in date rape. You didn't go to the police and at least give them a description of the guy. No, I did not. So you're part of the problem then? You're just allowing The police were already there. The security was already there. And the security chose to do nothing. It's a free speech area. They were, we were having a dialogue and the police chose to do nothing. But they were there, same way security's been around here. Security's been around here and they don't stop people from saying, Okay. What they say, okay? Why does it seem that hypocrites are more relevant in society today, or are at least more obvious than those who are not hypocrites? Because you haven't watched carefully enough all the humble followers of Christ on this campus who serve the poor, feed the hungry, just the way Jesus did. You don't need me to tell you about Frederick Douglass and Harriet Tubman. Go out and watch the movie, Harriet Tubman produced in 2019 about a black slave who escaped slavery and then due to her faith in Christ, she went back south. She went back and rescued hundreds of slaves from slavery because of her faith in Christ. Come on, wake up you guys. Smell the coffee. There are followers of Christ all around who are doing incredible deeds in obedience to Jesus Christ. Right. Well, well, but, but my point, I think maybe, and a lot of people hold this belief, like what can we do about this hypocritical Christianity because it seems to be a pretty big problem that seems to be impacting a lot of people's lives in a real negative way. Yeah. And so as somebody who's like having this platform and really like talking uh, about, you know, how great Jesus is, I respect that. I 100% respect you for that, and I respect you to have that belief. But I think that you've got to recognize uh, that whenever other people hear that, they're expecting you to turn around and acknowledge, like, okay, but here's the work that we got to do, okay? Here's here's all the kids that keep getting diddled, and this is what we're going to do about it, okay? Here's the uh, all the homophobia that happens. Here's what we're going to do about that, you know? I think that that's what people want to hear. Good. I am convinced that the ultimate solution to America's problem is not going to occur on Tuesday. And it's not going to occur in 2024 either. I'm saying the ultimate solution to America's problems is Jesus Christ, not a political agenda. I don't care if it's Republican or Democrat. Why did God allow Hitler to kill six million Jews in Germany? Why does God let normal, healthy, innocent children die of natural disasters and severe diseases and war. Ultimately, I... This doesn't this prove that God is disinterested in human affairs. And if he is disinterested in human affairs, why would anybody worship him? When God became a human being, what happened to him? Okay, now he's a classic example of what I'm talking about. He asked a very hard, very serious question, and before he even allowed me to answer, he walked away. Is that being open-minded? 
No, he didn't ask a question. He made a point. I want to hear But he disguised it in the form of a question that is intellectual dishonesty. I'd like to hear the answer. I'm so sorry. You go ahead. Oh, I was just saying, I'd like to hear the answer to that question. Why should we worship him if Thank he you. either doesn't care if we die Thank or if he's much. not all powerful? I appreciate your honesty. First point when we say that God is all powerful, we do not mean that everything that happens is God's will. Why? The all powerful God chose to limit his power by creating us with a free will. So if I walk up to her, smack her beautiful face, and then turn to you and say, God made me do it. I'm a liar, I'm a con artist. God gave me a hand for a purpose, purpose to respect her and to love her. But because I have a free will, if I choose to abuse this hand, roll it into a fist and send it crashing into her beautiful face, and then have the audacity to say, God made me do it, I'm a liar, and I'm a con artist. Yeah, I, I have an issue with how you're characterizing moral relativists. Yep. Um, it seemed pretty disingenuous saying that, like, uh, there's no basis at all that anything can come around because of cultural norms, when moral relativism could be based within a specific ideal. Um, probably the biggest thing I can harken back to is as society was forming, uh, with just humans or even Neanderthals or after the Pisces, um, there was a founding moral there, which would, which would be the good for society, the good for our tribe. Now, that's obviously evolved pretty far from where we're at right now, but to say that a moral relativist can justify Nazi Germany, which a bad one probably could, but just as a bad Christian could uh, could inspire the Crusades to go kill a bunch of Arabs, you probably shouldn't be judging it based on just the bad apples, right? My simple point is, all of my atheist friends are good people. They want to do good. A lot of good. But they have no intellectual foundation for good versus evil. Because if there is no mind prior to the human mind, then it's the human mind that defines good and evil, which means it is relative, which means if this human mind defines good and evil one way, and this human mind contradicts her but defines it another way, she's not right, she's not right, she's not wrong, she's not wrong. If moral relativism is true, it is totally arbitrary, good and evil. It's like, do you prefer broccoli or asparagus? It's a taste, it's a prejudice. Do you prefer murdering people or not murdering people? It's a taste. The reason that you should believe in God is because you know that that's rubbish and you can't live that way, which is God knocking on the door of your mind saying, wake up and smell the coffee. There are objective moral absolutes and you know it. Every atheist knows it, every agnostic knows it. But then think, how can there be a moral absolute? The only way is if there is some type of God to create and define it. That's all I've been trying to say. Okay, uh, I, w I think we'd probably end up just having to disagree on that part. On all right, fine, part. we disagree. Um, but another question leading with that is, uh, so like when, when Jesus died, um, specifically right after there was an explosion of different Christian denominations, uh, some of which died out, some of which eventually went on to be the Catholic Church, how could you say that the taste of broccoli and asparagus would be objective when we don't know all the interpretations of Christ that came around when it first evolved from just a just a sermon from the Sermon on the Mount? So if somebody only speaks English, they ought to read the Hebrew Bible to be correct. False. Okay, why? Because translation is a study that involves integrity or a lack of integrity. And if a translator has done their homework and studied two languages, and if they're a person of integrity, they can translate from French to English, from Spanish to English, from Greek to English, from Hebrew to English. And translation is a very precise study. Now, is it absolutely like mathematics? No, it is not like mathematics because you're taking grammar, syntax, vocabulary of one language and you're translating into a different language with different grammar, different syntax, different word means. Okay. So it's not as precise as a mathemat mathematician would like, yeah. but it's a very s precise study, but it's different from math. Yeah, I, I just wanted that, that concession. That you, bet. you bet, absolutely. You bet. Well, the whole point of Christianity and believing in a God is you having faith in it. You having okay. faith in everything is going to be all right. Okay. But wait a second. 
there's such a thing as sincere faith and insincere faith. If I tell you I believe in Jesus and I hate his guts, guess what? I'm a phony Christian. I'm a liar. So if I say I believe in Jesus, I better love this man and not hate him. Because if I hate him, I'm violating what Christ taught. I'm a liar. What, right? did, what did that have to do with what I just said? <laughs> well, it's not just enough to have faith. The question is, is it sincere faith? It better be sincere faith, because there's a boatload of insincere faith shown in just what this guy on the bike was talking about, Christian hypocrites. You know that, man? It's hypocritical faith, right? I feel what you're saying. I feel what you're saying. But like, All right. I'm not really <laughs> clicking right now. All right, now. But, but then let's go on to the next step. I believe in Jesus. Okay. And you ask me, Cliff, why do you believe in Jesus? And I say, because I have faith. That's not a good answer. Why, why it ain't? Because there better be a you reason. Can, I, I, feel, I feel you can live how you want to live. Like, you can, like, listen to me what I'm saying. Yep. I can say I'm Christian. Right. But I can be a hypocrite. I feel what yep. you're saying on that. Right. But what's the point in believing in the God if you don't have faith in the God is real? You're right. You got to have faith. You're right. But please think through this word faith. Okay. Tomorrow morning, I'm going to get on an airplane. Okay. Fly to New York City. Yeah. When I'm standing there at Austin Airport, can I prove to you that that hunk of metal is going to bring me safely to New York? Okay. No, I can't. But is there evidence that that hunk of metal was put together by reliable mechanics? Yeah. So based on that evidence, I'm going to take a step of faith. Okay. And I'm going to make a commitment to a hunk of metal to fly me through the sky to New York City. Okay. You see, there's faith, biblical faith is evidence plus commitment. Okay. That's why Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, if Jesus Christ is not risen from the dead, our faith is bankrupt, false, okay. foolish. But because Jesus did rise from the dead, our faith in him is good, reliable faith. I don't believe in God because I'm scared to die. I believe in God because the evidence of your eye convinces me there's got to be an intelligent mind behind you. You got it. Good to meet you, man. If I say, ma'am, I've really enjoyed talking with you, I'm making a judgment call, right? I'm saying, I've really enjoyed your respect, your politeness, thank you. If I say to you, you know, I really don't appreciate the way you were disrespectful. That's a judgment call. That is different from your motives are bing, bing, bing. I don't know what your motives are. I do know that you were either respecting me or disrespecting me, at least that's what you communicated, but I don't know what your motives are. What you did 10 years ago, I don't have the faintest idea. And so if I tell you after you tell me what you did 10 years ago, if I look you in the face and say, you're lying, that's incredibly judgmental. Because I don't know what you did 10 years ago. Okay? So, we're, not, we're out here making a lot of judgment calls, saying, this is true, this is false. But we're not out here saying, this is what motivates you, this is what you did five years ago, 10 years ago, or didn't do, and if you tell me you did it, you're a liar. No, we're not doing that. We're presenting Christ and saying, the evidence is he's the truth. If you disagree with him, please tell us what you believe in and why you believe it. So we're having that kind of discussion, but we're not saying you're evil because you uh, don't know what you believe in. <laughs> okay. But do you understand how it might make some people feel like you're, yeah. you're saying? Oh, no doubt about it. We live in a culture where when President Trump won the election a few years ago, college students went to crying chambers for counseling. When my dad was 18 years old, he sat up on a mountain in Switzerland and looked at Hitler's panzer divisions about to storm into Switzerland. Fortunately for my dad, they didn't, all right? So there is a big cultural change from 18-year-olds getting ready to go fight in World War II versus a culture where college students are saying, please help me. I'm emotionally falling apart because Donald Trump won the election. There's a big difference. So yes, I can understand why people will say, Cliff, you standing out here saying, Jesus Christ is the truth, hurts me, 
It offends me. So yeah, I understand that. So if, if tomorrow I feel like a woman, does that make me a woman? Sure, if you want to be. Okay. <laughs> I would argue that male and female is a biological thing. Well, man and woman and male and female aren't the same thing. Gender and sex aren't the same, even by definition. I would insist that female means a woman, male means a man. Why? And I would argue that if I wake up tomorrow and feel like a woman, my feelings are out of touch with reality. Because in reality, I'm not a woman. In reality, I'm a man. Why? Why? Yeah, why is that reality? Why because that is what the language male and female means, and that is my experience of reality. Okay. If I feel like Superman tomorrow, that does not make me Superman. Why if not? I feel like, because I can't fly, and if I try and jump off the side of that building because I think I'm Superman, I'll kill myself by splattering all of the cement down there. And if I feel tomorrow like I'm Albert Einstein, in reality, I'm not Albert Einstein. I have nowhere near the intellectual strength in mathematics and science that Einstein had. Okay, but you're listing characters and specific people. Genders and characters and specific people aren't the same thing. Well, I think That's gender is very physical. You're either male or That's female. Sex. Very if biological. You, if you look up the definition, it's, it's very different, sex versus gender. Just because I feel something doesn't make it true. Sort of. I feel like you still didn't really address what I was saying about sex and gender. That's fine, ma'am. So if you want to call yourself a horse, that's fine with me. You're a horse. I love horses, okay? If you want to call yourself they or it or he or she, go right ahead. Call yourself whatever you want to. And I respect your right to call yourself whatever you want to. I don't understand it because I don't think you're a horse. I don't think you're a they. I think you're a person that I'm trying to take seriously, and based on what I see, I don't think you're a guy. Maybe you are. I'm not a guy. All right, okay. So I would call you she. But if you don't like that, tell me what you want me to call you, and I'll try and call you. I, whatever pronouns, I don't care. But All right. I, I don't know, I'm just, I'm, I'm confused at, if you're so into like seeking truth, I'm confused why you don't have a reason for why you say that sex and gender aren't different when... Well, what is the difference? Just educate me. Tell me, what's the difference between gender and sex? Sex is your, like, reproductive organs, okay. and gender is the, like, social constructs and, yeah. like, things that are to that. So, is a person going to go to hell or face some sort of issues if they identify as gay, if they are intersex and choose not to have an operation, if they choose not to adhere to normal gender norms? No, nobody goes to heaven because they say, I'm a guy, or I'm a girl, or I'm they. It's not the issue. The issue is how do you as a person respond to Jesus Christ, respond to God? That's the issue. Okay, so if they decide to be in a relationship with a man or a woman, and they're also a man or a woman, like, is that a sin that is going to send them to hell because they choose to do that? Are they still not responding to Jesus Christ in the right way just because they want to love someone else? I have not responded to Jesus Christ in the right way. I am a sinner. Okay. I have perverted the gift of human sexuality that God has given me. Through heterosexual lust, I have perverted that gift. I don't deserve heaven, but God loves this sinner so much that he sent his son Christ to die on a cross to forgive me for my wrongdoing. I have put my faith in Christ, and he's forgiven me and given me eternal life. Now, just because someone has twisted the gift of sex differently from me, doesn't mean that they don't need Christ just as much as I do. So the question is, are we willing to repent, ask Christ for forgiveness, and put our faith in him, or are we just going to go and rationalize our wrongdoing? I mean, it's not difficult for me to understand why prostitutes that I've worked among say, listen, Cliff, it's the best way for me to earn money. So I'm going to be a prostitute. I understand that. But I plead with them, that is not what God intended you to do with your beautiful body. So. Why would I choose to be a follower of Christ? I choose to be a follower of Christ 
because I look at all the options that I'm presented with, and to be honest with you, ma'am, the options that I pres was presented with most starkly was materialism. I grew up in a very wealthy suburb of New York City, and it was very clear what God is. Your stock portfolio and your bank account. That's what's ultimately worthy of your worship. And if you don't make a lot of money, you are a loser. Secondly, I was presented with the option of hedonism. All of my friends did drugs and slept around. And they kind of made fun of me for not. So that I had to seriously consider that as an option. It was right in my face. Another option I was faced with was atheism and agnosticism. Because I had a number of professors who were atheists and agnostic, and they really tried to convince me that atheism or agnosticism was the way to go. So I looked at all those clearly, as I was able to, but I also looked at Jesus Christ, and I read the Gospels, and I began to look at my life, my experience of life, and my thinking, and my observation of other lives. And I became convinced over a long period of time that Jesus Christ was so superior to every other option. It's a no-brainer. A no-brainer. Then I began to speak on college campuses, and I began to realize, you know something, these professors are a lot more intelligent and a lot more educated than I am. So maybe they know something that I don't know. And so I began to ask very intelligent professors. We're talking MIT, Columbia, University of Pennsylvania, the Ivy League schools, we're talking about Stanford. And I would ask them two questions. The first question was, what are you living for? And the question, second question was, What's the evidence that what you are living for is true? And ma'am, the answers that I got to those two questions were scary. They were so poorly thought out, they were backed by almost no evidence. I became more and more convinced Jesus Christ is the truth. Now, if you don't understand what I'm saying, just listen to the people who've been challenging me out here. What people like to do is poke holes in Christianity, in Jesus Christ. Okay? Fair enough. No problem. But you see, here's the problem. The problem is, after you finish poking holes, you gotta go home the same way I gotta go home. You gotta put your head on a pillow and go to sleep, and I gotta put my head on a pillow and go to sleep. What are you living for, buddy? And what's the evidence that what you are living for is true? Some of you should be really squirming right now because you know very, very well that you have never asked, what is the evidence that whatever it is I've chosen to live for is true? I'd like to invite you to Grace Community Church located at 365 Lukeswood Road in New Canaan, Connecticut. Our services are at 9.30 a.m. and 5.30 p.m. on Sundays. Hope you can join us.